finding out that, for example, Wes Jackson and his Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, are correct in their economic analysis and draft horses are more cost-effective, more cost-effective than tractors in most kinds of modern farming in the United States. Warren Johnson's mechanism is, I think, a wonderful mechanism. You may not believe it, but I think it uh, at least has elements which would let you believe it if you wished, because it just happens. It's something that just happens. It has the inevitability of Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons, but without the tears. Even Paleolithic thinkers like the planners of the electric utility industry are coerced by this kind of mechanism, and we can see this beginning to happen. It's not bearded protesters who are killing nuclear power, but the discovery that a power-generating technology that consumes more kilowatts and more dollars than it generates is dangerous for the company's health. That's why so many plants are being canceled and so many new ones are not being ordered. When people start dropping out of a system for economic reasons, it has the effect of accelerating the process of change and making further change easier. When people stop buying their tractors from John Deere and their power from Con Ed, to use the name of our local New York power company, they are no longer at the mercy of these companies, and the company's power over others weakens also. As Warren Johnson says, quote, the best thing about small-scale solar or wind power, firewood, methane digesters, bicycles, and farm horses is that they all will help break the power of the big energy corporations. Any contrived advantage the big corporations may gain will soon turn counterproductive, for such gains will simply encourage the use of renewable resources, close quote. Moreover, because of the highly interlinked nature of the old system, the effect of any positive change will reverberate and be multiplied. For example, in a frugal society of highly independent small communities, the amenities of life are achieved with a very low cash flow. I know a couple that lives a, I would describe, a fairly luxurious existence in a fine house in Maine on a cash flow of about $3,000 a year. They don't owe anybody a penny. They make frequent trips to their in-laws in New Jersey. They visit Scandinavia. They have a very nice time. When this sort of thing happens on a wider scale, the government will no longer have sufficient tax income to support a massive bureaucracy, to build extravagantly expensive and destructive barge canals, or to think of turning Utah into an MX missile racetrack. <laughs> Another powerful force working against the system and in favor of Warren Johnson's automatic resolution of the environmental crisis is the prevailing fascination with the doctrine of efficiency. Efficiency is an awful thing, but it is kind of helping us in a way. Efficiency is the great rallying cry of the technocrats and the planners. We hear it around universities all the time, at least we sure do at Rutgers, which is a state university like this one, so I suspect you hear it too. To those interested in short-term benefits, it does have a sort of rudimentary appeal. But the trouble with efficiency is, if you think about it, that there's no reason why the most efficient solution to a problem should necessarily be the best. As a biologist, I find it very interesting to see how seldom nature chooses the most efficient way of designing the physio physiology, the structure, or the behavior of organisms. All kinds of mistakes nature makes, and yet there it is. Mistakes from an efficiency point of view. Of course, evolution is slow, it's wasteful, it's clumsy. We all know this. Nevertheless, in any complex system, making one part of the system more efficient may well have other deleterious effects on other parts. This is one of the things that's going to confound the genetic engineers in agriculture who are designing, to use their words, new crops. Another basic flaw in the universal application of efficiency is that it robs us of the time to observe and to evaluate our actions and to make adjustments. In other words, it kills feedback. Things happen too fast. And a third fundamental problem is that efficiency kills redundancy, which is always described as something good to kill. Again, especially at universities. God help us if we have two ecology courses taught by two professors. You might hear two different points of view. So it kills redundancy. There's only one most efficient way to do anything. Redundancy has become a dirty word in our society, which is too bad, because it's immensely valuable, far more valuable than efficiency in ensuring long-term survival 
as the planners of the space shuttle seem to be finding out. Thus, the push for efficiency, <clears throat> which is so compelling in the short run, is another instability, another self-destruct mechanism built into the system, which is leading to the fragmentation of the system and is making possible the development of alternatives, part of Warren Johnson's mechanism. Now, what about the dangers associated with muddling towards frugality? The obvious one, of course, is to quote Johnson, as the economic pie grows smaller, the natural tendency will be for everyone to try to maintain the size of his own piece. Close quote. Of course, the only way to do this is to prevent some people from getting to the pie at all. If the pie is shrinking and you want your own piece, you've got to keep somebody else from getting to the pie. Black unemployment is now at an all-time high. As the pie shrinks further, other groups are joining the blacks. The motto here is women and children first. Uh, only not with the same effect as uh, getting off a sinking ship. The elderly, too, could be added to that. Anger is bound to increase when this sort of thing happens. And democratic freedoms are going to be seen to be inconvenient by those who are still munching away at what's left of the pie. The potential for violence and chaos is obviously very great. But more and more people will have the chance to learn that you can live a good life without that particular pie, and that, I think, remains a basis for hope. Now, a fourth hope is for a change in prevailing attitude or worldview that now dominates the planet. There are perhaps trendier terms I could have used, mindset, global consciousness, and so forth, but I don't think these really add anything to the meaning. Such a change would once again bring to the foreground some rather old ideas. The idea of limits to human power and ability, the idea of interdependence of life forms, that we depend on all kinds of things. The idea of the wisdom of nature, these would be among the most important that we would return to. Also, several comparatively new ideas would also have to figure in such a revolutionary change. Most important among these would be the idea of finite resources and the idea that for each human endeavor there is an appropriate scale of activity, a best size and scope of the project with the realization that best and biggest rarely coincide. In the case of this latter idea, which E.F. Schumacher popularized with the phrase, small is beautiful, I think we can see the beginnings of a new worldview quite clearly. Even now, one can see new battle lines being drawn to replace the stale and outmoded 19th century conflict between socialism and capitalism, with a more pressing contemporary struggle of big versus small, of conglomerate versus separate, of complex versus simple. Ironically, the new right, or radical right, which we heard about last night, heard from and about last night, has caught a hint of this conflict and has tried to identify itself with the individual, the simple, and the small, that side of the fight. While the American left, which ought, I think, to have a much greater and more natural affinity with this particular position, is still wallowing around in the social welfare gigantism morass of 1962. I expect that if a new view emerges, we will see many of the old liberals and some of the real conservatives allied together against the forces of bigness and the myth of control. <coughs> Are such widespread changes really possible? We can't know for sure, but such changes have certainly occurred in the past. The rise of monotheism, the decline of classical Roman values, and the rise of Christianity the Cartesian Industrial Scientific Revolution, these are just some of the best-known examples. Dramatic changes in the way people thought. Moreover, the change can occur quite suddenly, perhaps in a half a century or less. In our time, we have our own prophets of change. There's Mumford, who speaks of irrationals and singular points I mentioned before, relatively small events and forces that can catalyze great world-sweeping transitions. There was the late Father Teilhard de Chardin, who spoke of the rise of a single world consciousness, or noosphere as he called it, sweeping around the planet. There are those like the late E.F. Schumacher, who stressed the independent growth and change of individual and community consciousness everywhere simultaneously. There was the late Aldo Leopold, whose plea was for a universally adopted extension of ethics to apply to the natural world, but who didn't go so far as to think of a single unified human consciousness. Another name that fits in here, and I don't have time to talk about it, is that of Robert Persig, whose book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, some of you may have read, in which he talks about the rise of the idea of quality. 
Are there actually signs that such a change can be happening? I think there are such signs. They're not big ones. The newfound proliferation and power of the humane societies and the animal rights movement, which has just absolutely taken off in the last few years. The immense popularity of uncontaminated natural foods. The growth of homesteading, self-sufficiency, new communities. The burgeoning movement of intellectual life outside the often corrupt and stifling universities the growth of barter networks and farm markets inside cities, the widespread dissemination and coordination of information about alternative lifestyles, and many others. Of course, there is a counter-indication for every indication. There are signs of entrenchment and resistance as well as signs of change. We're right in the middle of things, and we have a very poor, poor perspective for that reason. But at least we can say it's a valid hope, if not yet a reality. And the final hope for the environment and for humankind that I want to mention is one that most scholars and intellectuals find terribly embarrassing to mention in this age of humanism, and I suppose that's why I leave it for last. It's the belief that a higher power, God is a better word, will not allow us to destroy ourselves and nearly all of creation along with us. Now, this belief is not susceptible of proof, either for or against the argument. Moreover, although I'm not a theologian, I suspect that even the theological support for the idea is indirect and probably mixed. There is, for example, in the Hebrew Bible, the story of the covenant in which God promises after the flood not to unleash that kind of devastation a second time, but does the promise apply to destruction initiated by us? Theologians can argue about that one. There's also a separate covenant with Israel in Genesis chapter 17. And there is a messianic dream that is shared by both the Jewish and Christian traditions. Here again, a number of interpretations are possible. On the one hand, there's the Christian messianic view of the coming descent of the divinity to earth, and the Jewish messianic vision of the enhanced influence of the divine spirit in earthly affairs. And yet, on the other hand, hovering in the background, given varying weight by different traditions, but always at least a fear, is a vision of a period of utter corruption, violence, and possibly devastation, Armageddon in the Christian tradition which may precede the Messianic Age. On this subject, I'm going to follow the advice of Maimonides and not try to formulate a precise picture of what the Messianic Age will be like or exactly how it will come about, which he said, was, he said that was a waste of time. And I agree. If Dante couldn't give a convincing description of Paradiso, far be it from me to even attempt to fool around with the conception of the earthly paradise and the Messiah. Suffice it to say that, again, within these visions, I think there is plenty of room for hope. But I can add one thing that may be relevant. I doubt that any religion that contains the idea of a higher power and a magnificent creation would entertain, even for a moment, the idea that this uh, higher power would have created a part of the creation, namely us, humanity, solely for the purpose of destroying the rest of it. It doesn't seem to make much sense, and I doubt that it would in any tradition, at least that I'm aware of. Now, to what extent is a religious hope likely to be useful and to take hold in an age of science and reason? There was a time, certainly, when scientists viewed their own discoveries and knowledge about the earth and universe as tending to confirm the existence of God. To them, the laws and workings of nature were evidence of divine wisdom acting on a material world. Sir Isaac Newton was one such scientist, Another was John Ray, the great 18th century botanist. <clears throat> Ray's book, The Wisdom of God, manifested in the works of, of the creation, which went through many editions, very popular, immensely popular uh, catalog of proofs of God's wisdom found, to quote Ray's subtitle, and I'm quoting now, in the heavenly bodies, elements, meteors, fossils, vegetables, animals, beasts, birds, fishes, and insects, more particularly in the body of the earth, its figure, motion, consistency, and in the admirable structure of the bodies of man and other animals, as also in their generation, etc., with answers to some objections, close quote. That was the subtitle. Of course, the 19th century rise of scientism and scientific humanism, based on the great successes of physiology and evolutionary theory and chemistry and physics, mathematics, shoved this kind of thinking very much into the background where it has remained ever since. But during the past decade or so, it has begun to be demonstrated that the human ability to comprehend the universe has been greatly exaggerated. 
that our ability to know and understand has fundamental limits and uncertainties. We see this now in physics and mathematics, uh, all kinds of areas, biology. And this has shown us once again that science isn't necessarily incompatible with religious and spiritual beliefs. Perhaps we're now too sophisticated to advance scientific proofs of the existence of God the way Ray did, but we are also, I think, growing too wise to pretend that we can use science to prove the opposite. At any rate, belief in a higher power offers legitimate hopes of many kinds to people who are deeply concerned with what's happening to the world. In conclusion, I want to point out that although these three bases for hope that I consider legitimate are in a sense collectively passive, nevertheless none of them offers a license for personal passivity. For those who believe that the world is muddling towards frugality, the message is be adaptable, adapt, go out and learn how to live happily and successfully in the style to which you will have to become accustomed, rather than being dragged kicking and screaming to it. This learning to be adaptable will also help to bring into existence the very conditions you're preparing for. To those who are waiting for a new world view, the obvious positive action to take is to become one of those who understands, embraces, and spreads this new world view rather than remain a person who clings sourly to the old one. And to those who adopt a religious hope, and this I suppose is directed more at uh, Secretary of the Interior Watt rather than anybody in this room, to those who adopt a religious hope, one can say that it is a reasonable assumption that it is the good stewards, those who work to bring a divine harmony to the planet, who will merit the richest reward, indeed whose work itself becomes the beginning of the reward. Finally, I want to say that a quote from a friend of mine, Wendell Berry, who wrote, The use of the world is finally a personal matter, and the world can be preserved in health only by the forbearance and care of a multitude of persons." Close quote. The statement I would regard as both true and hopeful. It really embraces all of the separate hopes that I've mentioned today. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer questions if there are any. Yes. In your comments about muddling to frugality and moving toward a society of smaller, independent units, um, do you see anything positive in the new federalism, the return to the states? Is that a trend that will eventually go back to the return to the community? The, the question is, is there something, along the lines of muddling towards frugality, is there something positive in the new federalism, return to the states? Uh, I think if it's real, it's positive. The question is, is it real? Uh, to give one quick example, we in our state, as I've told you, cannot rely on the Environmental Protection Agency, which is a federal agency, for protecting the environment of our state. Uh, we re did rely on it fairly heavily in the past. We rely on our own Department of Environmental Protection. But unfortunately, about two-thirds of the budget of the Department of Environmental Protection is a federal budget of our state agency has a federal budget and that is being cut also. So you see there is nothing to rely on locally. If indeed they would turn back the monies that have been used not just for the bureaucracies in Washington other than military but including the military and make them available locally, yes I think it would be very positive. I think we're seeing this beginning to happen. I think people are realizing that we have enormous a uh, military machine which doesn't work, which couldn't fight its way out of a paper bag, relying on idiotic weapons which would uh, be catastrophic to us if we ever tried to use them, uh, and uh, losing all semblance of ability to fight battles, and that we could in fact have an effective structure at far less cost. It's the cost itself, it's the availability of unlimited money that's ruined it. Uh, this, I, I heard this from Admiral Rickover once, who uh, had a phone conversation with him, and he, his comment was that he was afraid that the only kind of war that we could fight now was a nuclear war because he said he didn't believe that the admirals and generals in the Pentagon knew how to fight any other kind of war anymore. That's very scary. But when you see that we can't even get eight helicopters into Iran and get them out again, you begin to wonder about where all this money is going to. So to, 
to repeat, I think the new federal.